Thank you. That was the university student ensemble from the Department of Music playing Paganini's Cantabile. On violin, Nikolai Koretsky. <laughs> and Fahed Katara on guitar. <laughs> Chairman of the board, Professor Alfred Tauber. Chairman of the Executive Committee, Mr. Muli Eden. President, Professor Ron Robin. Rector, Professor Gustavo Mesh. Honored members of the board, friends, faculty, and guests. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this 45th annual Board of Governors meeting. My name is Dr. Tami Harel Ben Shachar, and I'm the academic director of the Legal Clinics for Social Change at the Faculty of Law. This year, we stand at a turning point of a new era. President Professor Robin and his team are charting the course for an exciting future. We are reaching out in new directions, partnering with top institutions in northern Israel, collaborating across the world, and consolidating our reputation for academic excellence. Our researchers are making groundbreaking discoveries, and together we walk hand in hand with Israel's diverse population to build a stronger, more inclusive society. But no institution stands alone, and for me, it's a pleasure to invite our friends from Israel and abroad to share this journey with us. Ladies and gentlemen, to open the meeting, it's my honor to invite Chairman of the Board, Professor Alfred Tauber, to the stage. Good morning and welcome to the 45th meeting of the Board of Governors. Governors, I'm glad to see you. And to our president, our, re uh, our rector, uh, to the chairman of the executive committee, and to all of the uh, faculty and administrative members of the University of Haifa, we thank you for your support and the good works that you are doing. I would like to begin uh, with a, a bit of a somber note. Uh, unfortunately, four members of the Board of Governors have passed uh, away in the past year. I ask that you stand in the moment of tribute to them. Salman Falah of Israel, Marvin Sadowski of Canada, Rabbi Shir Yushev Cohen from Israel, and Max Witznitzer of the United States. May their memory be a blessing. Thank you. Okay, we are going to make a tribute, aren't we? Thank you, Professor Tauber. <clears throat> Before we begin, I'm proud to announce a special item. Last December, two faculty members from the Department of Hebrew and Comparative Literature each received one of Israel's highest accolades, the Emet Prize for Hebrew Literature. Professor Ronit Matalon is a renowned novelist. She heads our MA in creative writing as a, and is an important feminist and Mizrahi voice in Israeli literature. Professor Aleph Bet Yoshua's work is known throughout the world and was described as a unique and complex voice for all segments of Israeli society. Professor Tauber, it's a pleasure to invite you back to present the shields. Professor Matalon, it's my honor to invite you up. On both shields, there's a quote from the Bible which refers to the incredible power of words. From Proverbs 18, the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. I'll read the dedication out for the audience. This shield is presented to Professor Ronit Matalon in appreciation of her winning the Emet Prize in Literature 2016 and in recognition of her literary achievements and her unique and innovative contribution to the Hebrew literature of our time. The University of Haifa is proud of your achievements and your membership of its academic staff. Congratulations. Thank you so much to the University of Haifa, to the people who are here. Also, Alef Bet Yoshua and I know 
שהוקרה של ציבור או של קהל הקוראים היא לא דבר מובן מאליו. זה יכול למלא אותך גאווה, אני חושבת שזה מוטעה. אני מרגישה שההוקרה הזאת, אם כבר ממלאת אותי במשהו, אז זה באיזה סוג של צניעות כלפי מה שאני עושה, שהוא באמת עוד אבן במפעל גדול, שהוא התרבות העברית, שבה הדיאלוגים מתנהלים לא רק כאן ועכשיו בין סופרים, אלא בין החיים לבין המתים, בין הסופרים החיים והסופרים המתים, בין האנשים החיים לאנשים המתים. וזה בעיניי גם המקום העמוק של הספרות והאומנות, של הגשר הזה בין החיים לבין המוות. אני מאוד מודה לאוניברסיטה הזאת. שקיבלה אותי במאור פנים כזה מאוד לא מובן מאליו. לסטודנטים האהובים שלי, למי שיושב כאן, תודה רבה לכם. I'll read the dedication. This shield is presented to Professor Aleph Bet Yoshua in appreciation of winning the Emet Prize in Literature 2016 and in recognition of your wide-ranging work and your important contribution to shaping social consciousness and crystallizing Jewish and Israeli identity of many in Israel and around the world. The University of Haifa is proud of your achievements and your membership of its academic staff. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I am one of the only people here that came here when there was only one building in 67. And I was working this university as a dean of students and then as a professor in the Hebrew literature department from 72, 1972. So I am the oldest and most veteran person here. And I want to say two things. First of all, about the question of integrating writers and poets in the departments of literature. I was the first in all the country that was recognized as a member of the faculty and a member of the department as a writer. I did not finish my MA and never have done doctorate, and I never wanted to do doctorate. So I got this professorship in the idea, and then this university was the first one who had done it. Afterwards, there are f many, many writers and poets in the Department of Literature all over the country. But the idea was that if you speak about literature as a restaurant, and the uh, professors are people who are coming to taste the, the plates, the food, and to express their opinion, there must be someone who is coming from the kitchen itself. And the writer is the person who is coming from the kitchen, and he can know not only what is done, but what could be done, and what was the mistake in the preparing of this food. The second thing I want to speak about, this university has taken upon itself the, the relationship with the Arab community in Israel. And this was a real vocation and a real target in the building of this university. And if you speak about a special thing in the university, a part of the sea, and the research of the sea, and of course other departments, this was a very important mission that the university has taken upon itself. I have to say to you that unfortunately, by our mistake and the Palestinian mistake, perhaps we are going to a binational state. 
And if we will go, unfortunately, but if we'll go to such an un binational state, the importance of the relation between the Jews and the Arabs, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, will be extremely important. And here in this university, I hope very much, and by the Board of Governors, that you will pay attention especially to the speciality of the Haifa University and Perhaps you will help all the Israel and the Palestinian to come to some sort of agreement and common life as it was done here. Thank you very much. Congratulations to both of you. Professor Tauber, please. We have some business to conduct. The accepted process for approval of our new members to the Board of Governors has been conducted, and now I have the pleasure of reading out the names of the new members. These include, as you know, uh, public members, uh, members from the administration, members from the faculty. Uh, those who are in attendance, uh, as I call your name, I would appreciate you standing. Uh, we have certificates of, of, you know, of recognition. Uh, to save time, I'm going to leave them here, and Esti or someone else will uh, be most pleased to uh, give it to you upon your request. Admiral Ami Ayalon, Mr. Bastian Belder, thank you. Professor Alan Dershowitz. Alan regrets he cannot be here. Uh, Mr. Yossi Elbaz. No. Dr. Ruvain Gall. Mr. Stanley Gold of Los Angeles could not be here. Mr. Dov Kehat. Kehat. Dr. Ron Lin, no. Jay Ruderman from Boston could not be here. And fortunately, Mr. Roberto Strauss. <laughs> Representatives of the Senate, or I should say the faculty. Professor Sholomit Almog. <laughs> Professor Ori Davidov. Professor Eran Vigoda Gado. <laughs> Professor Sharon Gill. Dr. Marcos Silber. Professor Naomi Yosman. Professor Moshe Kim. Professor Kobe Rosenblum. <laughs> Professor Aaron Shalev. They're all too busy working, teaching, doing their research. I'll get them here next year. Okay, faculty representatives. Professor Bacha Engel Yeager. <laughs> Professor Guy Enosh. <laughs> Professor Oren Gazal Eyal. Eyal, excuse me. <laughs> Professor Annabel Herzog. <laughs> Professor Jenny Kerman. And Professor Tali Kristal. <laughs> Toda. Administrative staff representatives. Ms. May Belson. There she is in the back. Uh, Ms. Ruthie Rabinovich. Rabinovich. Okay. We're delighted to welcome you as members of the Board of Governors. Thank you for your participation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell me. All right. Thank you, and we wish the new board members every success. 
Ladies and gentlemen, after this meeting, a devoted friend of the university will be stepping down as vice chairman of the board. Mrs. Sonia Landstein Kandel led the German Friends Association for over a decade with dedication and energy. She brought that commitment with her as vice chairman. Tonight, the university will present her with an honorary doctorate. Now is our chance to thank Mrs. Landstein Kandel for her contribution to this board. Professor Tauber. Sonia, this is a special delight for me. You've been a respected promoter of civil rights, tolerance, understanding in Germany, in German-Israeli relations, and a friend of Israel who have devoted an enormous amount of effort towards promoting coexistence between the Jews and Arabs in this land. You've been a significant supporter and partner at the University of Haifa for more than 20 years. For those of you who do not know Sonia, I urge you to meet her. She was born in Zagreb, Yugoslavia, and immigrated to Germany when she was a teenager. She studied economics, and at the age of 24, she embarked on an international career at the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, where she met her future husband, Manfred Lahnsteiner. and then she decided to return to Germany. She continued her professional career in a number of senior positions, including the regional manager of the German Development Corporation, the director of the Drager Foundation for International Economic Development, and pro bono commissioner for tolerance of the Bertelsmann Corporation, which of course I've mispronounced. Being an American, what can I do? Prompted by xenophobic and anti-Semitic incidents in Germany after reunification, Sonia devoted all of her free time to fighting intolerance. In the late 1990s, and together with partners from business, media, and culture, she founded a unique nationwide nonprofit initiative, Step 21, for tolerance and understanding. Step 21 runs uh, numerous innovative educational programs that provide social and media competence to youth in schools and in free project work and making use of modern media technologies. In recognition of her work, she received the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany from the federal president. Her commitment to coexistence and understanding was also the driving force behind her involvement with Jewish issues here in Israel. She serves on the board of trustees of the Berlin Foundation Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe and the Israelite Hospital in Hamburg. She also serves as the chairwoman of the German Friends of the Israel Museum and chairwoman of the German Friends of the University of Haifa, where until June of this year, she has served as vice chairman, vice woman, vice person of the Board of Governors. In both of these uh, Israeli institutions, she has been instrumental as a partner with academia and students to help launch meaningful and sustainable coexistence programs for young Jews and Arabs in Israel. She's a fighter, she's committed, she's utterly honest, and she will be missed as our Vice President. Could you kindly uh, come forward? Well, dear friends at the university, thank you very much. Um, I have come here today to Haifa, as usual, a little bit home. And really, it's my home, away from home. Whenever I come here, I feel good, I feel excited, I feel belligerent, but I also feel cheerful and motivated when I leave, in spite of, let's say, the chaos that I sometimes encounter here at the university. But the chaos is a wonderful chaos, and um, I am uh, invigorated every time by the beauty of this place and by the fact, as was mentioned already, that this is the place, actually, that shows the best of Israel in terms of everybody uh, living together, working together, not always without fight, but always side by side in peace. 
I've tried to do what I can and I'll continue. This is only just part of a farewell. Uh, it was wonderful to work with Fred and Irene and everybody else, but I'll continue to be on the board. I will continue to work with the German friends who are partners with the Jewish Arab Center and especially with our programs and um, involving Jewish and Arab students. I invite you everybody, if you will still be here, at what I consider the best event <laughs> of the Board of Governors where all the Arab and Jewish students and their families and everybody come together uh, and the university leadership, the German event um, on the 8th at 11 o'clock. We have some wonderful things for you there and you'll meet those that actually make this university. I wish the new leadership all the best, of course. I am there to help if I can. And I wish that you manage to put uh, University of Haifa on the map, Ron. I read your article in the newspaper. It was wonderful. You mentioned the right things, the right goals. And this time we are going to implement them, right? <laughs> so I am there to help. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Mrs. Lamstein Kandel. We also look forward to hearing your keynote address on Thursday at the German Friends Reception, The Future of the Past, German in Israel and the Values of Enlightenment. Right, Professor Tauber, it's my honor to ask you to make your report as chairman of the board. I'm celebrating uh, four years as the chairman of this Board of Governors, and I would uh, be happy to uh, announce that the expectations that I had when I joined the board uh, have been met. The vision is yet to be articulated completely but we have a new administration that has offered the Haifa community hope. Hope that the university will fulfill its profound mission of being the University of the North, the economic engine for the North, a paragon model for the integration of all the diverse peoples in the land of Israel, and it will succeed in achieving the academic excellence we all expect. The University of Haifa, in fact, is an extraordinary institution. We have gifted faculty, committed students, innovative programs, imaginative leadership. The president will outline the plans for the growth, expansion of the university tomorrow. In fact, this meeting is organized around the understanding of that vision. And frankly, it is the launch of a very ambitious program to raise more money than this university has ever raised. That requires the cooperation and commitment of all of us to achieve the goals that the President and the Executive Committee have outlined will require an enormous sum of money. I hesitate to even tell you what that number is, but it is very large. It is attainable. In fact, it must be attained because the university is poised for its next step in the academic firmament of Israel. It is poised to achieve a leadership role in certain areas that will be noteworthy not only within Israel but internationally. It is an opportunity for each of us to participate in a grand project. And I, for one, am extraordinarily excited 
about this opportunity to participate in an endeavor which really occurs only once in a generation. The University of Haifa is ready. The leadership is poised to lead. And what we need to do is to support them. And so I ask each of you to consider how you, in fact, will help in the next year or two as the plan un unfolds and we have particular goals that must be met. Now, standing here, I probably understand as well as anyone in the room how difficult this will be. People are committed to various projects, to various institutions, and the problem is to demonstrate how important, how unique the University of Haifa is and how worthwhile an investment in the university can be. This includes not only buildings, it includes scholarships, PhD support, new laboratories, new programs, new opportunities. And so the message must be brought forth and carried by each of us that the University of Haifa is a worthwhile, important endeavor, and it's an exciting place to participate. So my remarks this morning are really hinged on one word. It's a word that Barack Obama used to ignite the United States in the 2008 election, and the word is hope. The hope, in fact, that the dream might be, re might be fulfilled. And I expect that under the leadership of Ron Robin and Muli Eden and Gustavo Mensch, the university will enter that new phase. And so I offer an optimistic report, a report filled with hope that the university is about to be launched into a new era. So without further ado, I would like to call upon the president to make, uh, I think I want to call upon the president. No, I don't want to call upon the president. Oh, I know what I want to do. I want to present awards. Hey, I'm sorry. So the report of the president will follow the awards. Um, the Dusty and Eddie Miller Fellowship for Outstanding Young Scholar. Hmm? Not yet? That's what's on my paper. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Um, thanks, Professor Tauber. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, and thank you also for your support of the community in Israel. It's a great inspiration to us all. Supporting the community is also a great deal of my work as the academic director of the Legal Clinics for Social Change. And I'm proud that this institution encourages these connections. We strive to use law to create a better, more just society. Our students get a hands-on experience of law in action, providing an opportunity to reflect on theory and help them become thoughtful and socially aware lawyers. Our eight clinics are diverse, spanning rights for women, the elderly, education, the marine environment, and much more. I firmly believe our faculty's role is to combine quality legal education, <coughs> rigorous research, and assume a leadership role in Israeli society. I believe our next speaker understands this link between society and academia. After 32 years as an international high-tech leader, Muli Eden decided to join this university out of his passion for education. He's been called one of the top 10 technological minds of our generation, and we're proud to have him on board. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to invite Mr. Eden to make his first report as chairman of the executive committee. Mr. Eden, please. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. No signal. I'm used to it. This is the demo god. Whenever I'm on stage for the last 30 years, he's trying to take revenge at me. Eventually, we're supposed to have here some foils, right? OK, do your best. Fred, I know that you did start with something different than what was supposed to do. I don't know if you know about it, but in the Middle East, we start wars from smaller mistakes than the one that you just did. <laughs> so 
Let me start without the foils, and then I'll shoot them. Uh, you know, when I was approached, first of all, I'm a high-tech guy, 32 years. I was designing microprocessors. Most of the chance that if one of you have got a notebook or desktop, probably the brain of the computer that you were using was designed by one of the teams that I had the privilege to lead. It's not a one-man job. It's hundreds of people working on such a thing. And when Ron enjoyed himself, notice the wording, when he enjoyed himself on the East Coast of New York University, I was actually working in the Silicon Valley on the other side of the world. I was there nine and a half years, and I came back. And from being a microprocessor designer, what's called a chip head, when I went to the US, I was exposed to marketing. And when I came back to Israel, I was responsible for the biggest business unit of Intel, which was responsible for revenue of $32 billion. So I believe I had the privilege to be exposed to both worlds. Now, it was pretty interesting because, as I say, I was a high-tech person. Actually, not only a high-tech person, I was a Technion person. My father was the academic secretary of the Technion. I graduated the Technion. My big son graduated the Technion. And my granddaughter, when she was three years old, she knew already that she's going to be the most beautiful girl in the computer science faculty in the Technion. We need to change the script now. So I get a phone call from a person I didn't know, and he was trying to persuade me to come over to the university, which sounds pretty weird for me, but those of you who know Ron, it's very difficult to tell him no. And if you don't know him, you'll know it pretty soon. <laughs> so he was trying to persuade me why should I come to the university? And one thing, yes, I was always a big believer in education. I believe the state of Israel has got three problems. We've got economic problem, we've got security problem, and we've got a huge problem with the socioeconomic gap. The only thing that can resolve all the three issues is education, starting from kindergarten, school, high school, all the way to universities, etc. And then I say, wow, it's interesting, uh, maybe. And then he told me we needed the university innovation, which I agree. And then he told me, Muli, it will take you only half a day a week. And I agree. And from here, it started building storytelling. It had nothing to do with reality or truth, but I fell into this trap. And uh, eventually, I say, you know, Ron, let me interview 10 people in the university. And after that, I'll make up my mind. And he say, go ahead, do it. And I interviewed 10 people, and I find there's a lot of problems. And I said, that's interesting. By the way, Fred, I'm going to be the party pooper in the next 10 minutes. And I said, that's interesting. And the thing which I believe will be the best, the thing that eventually was very interesting is to take this culture of academic world, academic freedom, whatever they call it when they don't want to do something. They've got their own buzzwords. And combining with the high-tech result orientation, I want to see the thing now, this. I say, who is going to do it? We'll do it. When? What do you mean when? We'll do it. Who? We'll figure out somebody. No. Who is the person until one? And I saw the crash between the two cultures. and said, no, it doesn't have to be crash. This conflict can really be steered into an interesting place. And I say, wow, that might be interesting. So I say, okay, I'll go and interview a few of the people. And uh, first of all, let's see what are the challenges. That's how Ron talked. He, he, his English is fluent. It took me a few minutes to understand. This is not challenges, ladies and gentlemen. This is bloody big problems. The challenge, the challenge is to fix the problem. But what's the problem of calling a problem a problem? 50% of the solution is identify the problem. And then you know what you're... If you are trying to sugarcoat it, you don't know what you need to do. So I'll tell you what's my impression, not necessarily right. That was my impression after speaking with 10 people. First of all, there was huge external factors. Guys, it's not only in Israel, around the world. And the decision that was done in Israel, and I'm not going to argue about it because that's a fact of life we need to live in. Many colleges have been opened. Many students went to the colleges. Big debate, if, what is the quality of this guy? But this is the environment we need to act. And definitely, it's a problem that we need to give an answer. There was a major crisis in the management of the university. It's not a secret. I will not going to hide it. And interesting enough, by the way, Ami Ayalon, who had the privilege to replace, when he came to my home to try to replace me, and Ron actually took everybody, even figured out who, is, who are my friends, and they start calling me home. 
On the island told me, Muli, we had our challenges, we have got our problem, we've done our share. I believe it's time for us to step down and have new people because I don't believe we are effective enough. And his openness really helped me make up my mind. And he said, Muli, we have got a problem, we need to change. And as you can see, actually the whole management, Ron, Gustavo, my, are new people. If I go on to see what's the problem, there was not, no clear strategy. The first thing I did with every one of the persons that I was speaking, I said, what is the university's strategy? And 60, 70 percent, Ron about didn't know what the university strategy, and the other 30 gave me the strategy for the jour, which means everybody decide what his strategy for the university. And then I remember some people asked me, should we or shouldn't we absorb Braude? And I said, tell me what's your strategy. If it supports the strategy, let's do it. If it does not support the strategy, let's not do it. But if you don't know what's your strategy, how the hell you make decision at all? So this was very strange, very interesting. And again. My impression. Bad external image. It's not a secret. We are not respected enough as we should do by the environment. When I joined the university, some people called me, you know, you joined the Beer Z University? And many people, even in the university, start apologizing. No, let's take a lemon, make a lemonade. The fact that we are macrocosmos of Israel, if we'll show how to work with the Arabs, etc., 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 that's supposed to be our advantage, not disadvantage. We should not be apologetic about it, but guys, this is the perception about Israel, and this will define the flow of students or the quality of students that are going to come to our university. Definitely, we need to tackle it and change it. Going on, and by the way, there's a lot, esprit de corps. Many of the people that even work in the university are not proud enough. Some of the people that came to me to persuade me to come to the university said, Muli, we need to change the perception. There are seven universities, today there are eight, seven universities, we are number seven. And I'm a number person. When I start looking at the number of the university, guys, we are not number seven. In several faculties, we are the best in Israel. In several faculties, we are the second or third best in Israel. But the people that are leading the university, some of the faculty members told me, and this is the perception, how do you want the great people to come over? Insufficient fundraising. We spoke about it. Guys, when I was speaking with some of the deans, they were told me, Muli, we are losing PhDs or postdocs to other universities in Israel because they give them higher scholarship. It's crazy. And actually, I was sitting with Lily, I believe she is here two days ago, she is the Dean of Advance, I say, how much money you need in order to be able to match all the other universities? It's impossible, it's unacceptable that we'll use a good academic researchers due to money. If the subject is not interesting, okay. If the other researcher is more appealing, okay, but for money, this is not acceptable, and actually I believe that Rodney and myself decided this is not going to be the case in the next year. We are going to snore, we are going to beg. I don't know what we are going to do. But our responsibility to the academic world is to make sure that this will not be a reason. And by the way, we're just looking into it, and she gave me yesterday a spreadsheet with all the numbers. Say, hey, Muli, we need $1.5 per year in order to be able to match other university, because we give 120,000 shekels scholarship for a PhD and they give 240. This is not acceptable. This is part of the fundraising. And definitely Ron is laughing at me, say $1.5 million. Muli, you are speaking the small money. Shut up. I'll give you the 1.5. Let me deal with the big money. And Ron will speak about it later on. And the thing that drove me nuts, especially when I was speaking with the academic world, I said, what are you doing it? And the answer was, this is the way we all did it. And they say, for a high-tech person, the fact that you always did it, that's a good reason by itself to go and change it. And I'll share it with you in a second. And when I heard this word, which is annoying and crazy, I said, okay, yes, I'm going to join the university. And uh, I called Ron. A tooth in advertisement, I believe Ron was surprised. He was sure that I rejected it as well. And I'm still surprised until today, but that's another problem. But I believe that Rahm Emanuel, who is the chairman of, who was the chief of staff of Obama, and today I believe he's the mayor of Chicago, he said that the crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And I've seen it in Intel. All the best things that we've done in Intel are on the ashes of some problem that we failed, and then we come with something beautiful. And I say, if we've got a crisis, or if we are not the best, or the second best university in Israel, that's a great opportunity for us. So don't misunderstand me. During the interviews, there have been a lot of good things that we need to strengthen. First of all, sense of change. I'll definitely give the credit to Ron and Gustavo. I joined it later on. But people sense that there is a change, and I believe Fred spoke about it. And they say, we are willing. Some of the academic people, you will not believe it, even ask, is there a way we can help? 
This was supposed to be a joke. Never mind, I'll tell you when to laugh later on, because normally they think about their self and about their academic research, but people say, yes, we understand, we see the change, we would like to help you to drive the change. A new president and rector, many new young faculty members in the next five years, 25% of the faculty members of the university are going to change. And if we define our strategy, who are the people, and when I say we, it's definitely the academic section, not the management, definitely we can come up with a new university that will tackle the new challenges. Positive trend, I will not go into that detail, major improvement on national research model. We found out we got many more grants and articles and our share was increased, which gave us more money, but definitely it's a very positive trend. Line of sight to value at expansion, Broad of Vitz or Rambam, and intentionally, I will not elaborate, I don't want to duplicate, or that you'll hear Ron and myself twice, so my speech or my show talk today and Ron's talk tomorrow about the multiversity, etc. I see it as a one coherent picture, and he will complement whatever I will leave open-ended. And definitely focus on international collaboration, which Ron brought for, with him from NYU. So first of all, we start looking at the high-level strategy and truthful advertisement. This activity started, I believe, before I joined. I believe I was putting extra pressure on it, but some of the activity was done before. And you know, I'm a student. I look up to Andy Grove. Andy Grove one of, was one of the three founders of Intel, one of the smartest person in the world. And he came to the US to my lab. I was responsible for man machine interface, how to deal with computer. And he, he wanted to visit me before I came back to Israel. And he came to me, by the way, a Jewish refugee from Hungary, very strong accent. And he looks at me and says, Mr. Riden, can you articulate your strategy? And for two seconds, I was not working fast enough in my brain, which you always need to do when you're next to Andy. And I said, Do you want the 30 second version or the 30 minute version? And he looks at me and says, Mr. Eden, if you need 30 minutes to articulate your strategy, you don't have a strategy at all. <laughs> I still remember, sometime I wake at night. He was right. So we have our debates, and this is work in progress, and I believe we'll need to continue it. But I would like to take the commitment together with Ron and Gustavo that within a year, or less than a year, everybody will agree, everybody will understand it, everybody will be able to articulate at night. And this is the way that we judge project on everything based on the strategy. So this is work in progress, but I believe there's buying from almost everybody. We need to clean it. First of all, and there was a big debate, what is the university? We've got our responsibility to society, to the North, Jews, Arabs, or academic excellence? And the answer is, as a university, the first priority is academic excellence. Because if you have not have academic excellence as a university, you'll not get the best researchers, you'll not get the best students, you'll not get the best, you will not be able to drive all the other things which are so important to some of us or to many of us. And for that reason, when we go and make a step, the first question will ask us, is it going to help us to excel as an academic or not? If the answer is yes, we'll go there. Definitely, you need to be pragmatic. By the way, it was not so simple, but I believe that the University of Haifa well, all universities will be different universities 10 years from now or will not be. On the verge of change, it's true for high tech, true for everything, that's an opportunity to lose or to win, and I believe we need to win. But the university is going to be different, the teaching is going to be different, and if we'll be able to do it, we'll get the students that we need. And definitely, it's important, we need to strengthen the Israeli society, and Fred and many people spoke about it, and you'll hear a lot about it. I believe we've got a major objective because we are kind of a picture of a microcosmos that need to be in Israel if we'll be able to do it, everybody. Now, we don't finish this because Andy Grove, the, you know, the pe person that I admire, and he was also my nightmare, he was always looking at me when I came with a great idea, and he's telling me, Mr. Riden, your strategy is as good as your execution. <laughs> so you can come with whatever strategy you want, but if you do not know how to implement it, it's bullshit. So I'll go very fast. And I'll give you only one example. Hiring outstanding faculty member, it costs money. And retaining existing outstanding, which is not less important. Strengthening research, BNB perceived as one of the leading academic. And the last one served the new wave, digital everywhere. And you'll hear tomorrow about digital humanity, digital social sciences, all kind of crazy things. So we've got the next level of detail. And the most important, I'll go to the other thing, is the road to implement our strategy University of Haifa, the multiversity is something that Ron is pushing very strongly. 
I believe Fred elaborated on it. It's the next level of detail. It's not the final things, but definitely it's not only a strategy. It's a strategy, and it's a plan that supports the strategy in order to be able to implement it and be a different university. Because again, if we are not in the top three, we need to be different. Now, if I need to share with you one thing from 33 years in the high-tech industry, is this graph. This is the number of bits that's running in the internet. I will not elaborate 10 in the power of 18, it's a huge number, and this was true for 2015, but the point which is important in the next two years, we'll have more bits in the internet than the number of bits that went in the internet since the internet was invented. IBM said that if you look at the data that exists in the universe today, 90% of the data was stored there in the last two years. If you look at the transistors, which again coming from my territory, but transistor for you, it's a Lego, it's a building block of every computer, every phone, every electrical device. The number of transistors that we are going to ship in the coming two years is going to be bigger than the number of transistors that have been shipped to the market since 1949 when the transistor was invented. What am I trying to say? Guys, the world used to be linear. 30 years ago, it was fun to manage in Intel. Today, the world is exponential. Things are running so fast, it's almost impossible to predict. It's difficult to run this business. But the important message, and if there's one message I would like to leave you with when I'm leaving this stage, is the following. The exponential phenomena looks like a technology revolution, but it is not. The exponential phenomena affect every fact of our life. Let's take an example. If I look at geopolitical, you know the Arab Springs? I'm afraid to speak over here. There are many people that really know what they're talking about. So correct me if you call me honest if I make a mistake. The Arab Spring, there was an Arab in Tunisia. He was harassed by the police, etc. He killed himself. So what? Many Arabs have been, been killed before. Many will be killed later. You take this person that was harassed, that committed suicide, you compare it with Facebook and Twitter, and you've got revolution that sweeps almost all the Middle East. That's a technology inspired revolution. Let's look at another thing. What's happening today all over the Middle East? London, another definitely exponential phenomenon. Sorry? ISIS, definitely, Daesh. This is an exponential phenomenon. And I remember I was in Saban Forum and I was speaking with Hillary and stuff like this, and I was there for three days, and I say, guys, you didn't surprise me for a second. I'm here three years, three days, which means you think linear. The world is acting exponential, you're going to be dead, it's going to hurt you. ISIS, let's look at economy. Airbnb, how many rooms do they have? Zero. How many rooms do they rent? More than many, many of the other hotels. If you look at the uh, car industry, the same. Whenever you look at each section of our life, it's changing exponentially, inspired by technology. I will not go into this detail because there are professors over here, but social networking, the way that we communicate with each other, all these things are exponential changes. And for that reason, I said the university and everything around us is not going to be any different than this. And time constant is changing. What we used to do in five years, we need to do in three. What we used to do in three, we need to do in one. What we did one, we need to do in five months. That's how we do design in Intel. And gentlemen, if we'll not be able to do it in university, we'll not be competitive. The world is not waiting for us. Now, the reason I believe we can do it, because I believe we are on the verge of the fourth revolution, that because we are living in it, many people do not feel it. I'm claiming it for four years. I see more and more people also recognize it as a revolution. The Industrial Revolution have got three revolutions. This is the fourth one. The first one was definitely the steam. The second one was the electricity. The third one was what we called ICT, Information Communication Technology Internet. And the fourth one is the one that we are living right now in the combination of four frightening vectors. The first one is unlimited compute power in, the, in your fingertips. Guys, everybody that's got a phone, you've got more compute power in order of magnitudes, more than the Apollo shuttle that went to the moon. <laughs> I know that he's trying to hunt me. Try, try hard. So first of all, We've got compute power. Now try without the foils, try to be with me. Shoof. So one is compute power. The other thing is data. Why? We've got unlimited amount of data. Beautiful. 
unlimited amount of data from IoT, stuff like this, and I'll show you about it in a moment. The third one, which I believe we are touching in the university, is artificial intelligence, which means all these algorithms that together with the compute power and the data, we can do things that we always wanted to do but couldn't do in the past, and pretty soon, and I'll not touch about it at all, we are going to develop computer with the same compute power as your human brain. And the last thing is definitely the issue of robotics. This is humanized, but I'm speaking about robots as ge in general. Let me give you an example of what we are speaking. When I graduated the Technion, I was dealing with kilobytes, 1,000 bytes when I was working in my computer. If you look a few years later, when we have our computers, our terminals, and the computer was in the back, we were dealing with megabytes. A few years later, when we invented the internet in the 90s, we were speaking about gigabytes. When we speak about the mobile, which we are using today, we are already speaking terabyte, and we try to predict what will happen in 2020, we are speaking about more bits, more information than the stars in the universe. We speak actually about zeta byte, those of you who like the numbers, 10 in the power of 21. So, the big revolution we are going to have, and I believe that we we'll need to make sure that the university is jumping on this way, is the big bang of data, which means how do we deal with this huge amount of data, but on the other thing, which is not less important, more important, the bank of big data, which means how you, to, you utilize all this information in order to come with a conclusion, how you collect, how you analyze, and most important, how you predict. Today, with this amount of data, many times we do not know to ask the, the question, but we've got the tool that can help us to look at this huge amount of databases. I'm speaking with Ron, I speak with Gustavo, I know that they share the vision, I know that you'll hear tomorrow strange words like digital humanities or digital social sciences or things that if we'll be smart enough to jump on this wagon, we'll be among the first university. I believe, and this is my personal opinion, I might be wrong, that in five, ten years you will not be able to do a thesis without being able to utilize this technology, not necessarily develop it, but at least know how to use these technologies. So what is the challenge? And I've got the last three foils, or four foils. What is the challenge the university have? I believe the challenge of university, when I talk about it before I told yes to Ron, is the same challenge as the high school. And if you come to think about it, it's very simple. Why? Because I don't know what the world will need from your people 10 or 15 years from now. But what I do know is that what you are teaching them today is going to be non-relevant 10 or 15 years from now. And we heard about it yesterday. So we need, it's very simple, we should prepare students to jobs that don't exist yet, to solve problems that haven't been defined yet, using technology that haven't been invented yet. That's the only challenge that I believe the university has, and the high school, and the kindergarten. Very simple. See, we should prepare students to jobs that don't exist yet, because you'll agree with me, you've got no clue what will happen 15 years from now. By the way, it's going to be totally different because of robots. Autonomous car is going to put 90 million people unemployed, etc. I will not go into this. Guys, I can show you a diagram of billions of unemployed people that are going to be replaced by robots in the next 10, 15 years. Great thing for the University of Haifa to dive, deep dive into and be ahead of the rest of the world. It's a tsunami coming. We need to solve problems. Nobody can tell me what's the problem that's going to happen 10 years from now. And we do not know what's the technology. We didn't have artificial intelligence 15 years ago, at least for the people. And the answer is very simple. We need to teach our students to think. We need to teach them to learn. Guys, I graduated the Technion. The Technion didn't prepare me for anything I did in Intel. I did microprocessor with two billion transistors. In the Technion, I did experiment on two transistors. But the Technion taught me how to learn. And when I came to tackle new issues, I had the toolbox to learn because the problem had been totally different. And I'll finish with three quotations. The first one, <laughs> you're too fast. Go back, go back. No, you cannot blame me. To get such an attitude, I can stay with my wife at home. Knock it off. This was a joke. <laughs> and don't tell my wife. You'll see her tonight. First of all is Elvin Toffler. He was a futurist, and he was the editor of Fortune 500. And he say, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be who does not know to read and write, but who does not know to learn, unlearn, and relearn. And by the way, if I look at the high-tech again, 
I believe that many of the high-tech people will come to their end of their, their career at the age of 45, 50. We look to go to school again and learn and be prepared for new opportunities. And again, we can be there after we decide if this is really the thing which is in our strategy. The third thing I want to share with you, it's a very, I don't know, sad or great. This is one of the people that I really admired. I believe it's a tragic person. And he invited me to his house. And actually, I believe probably I was the last one that saw him before he passed away. And now he invited me to his house, and he wanted to speak about the robots. I will speak about when are we going to have microprocessor, human brain, all this kind of thing. And he was, his curiosity was crazy. You know, he, and he was asking me questions that, that scientists didn't ask me. And he said, Muli, I would like to speak about it. And when I, we speak again about robots, what's going to happen, he asked me a question. He said, Muli, how are we going to make sure that all this progress is going to be ethical? And I thought for a second, and I say, Mr. Perez, I don't want to frustrate you, but if I look at all the progress in the world, at least that I was working, it was done either due to military uses or due to economy, greed, Ethics was never driving any innovation. Ethics came later on. You know, we started with atomic bomb that we threw in Hiroshima. Then we came, okay, the treaty, what do you do? It's stuff like this. And then he said to me a sentence in English, and we never spoke in English. And I don't know if this was the will that he left me. He said, Muli, technology without ethics is evil. Ethics without technology is poverty. That's the reason we must combine the two. And I believe, really believe in it, and I got it before I say yes to Ron, that the University of Haifa, with his expertise, is positioned probably better than any other university to take advantage of these things, because today when you do high tech, you cannot progress because you don't know what to do with the ethical problem. You hear about autonomic cars, and I spoke with somebody, but if you've got the option, and you do the calculation, the algorithms, the artificial intelligence, and then you have two options. Either you kill him or you kill the driver. Who do you kill? That's nothing to do with high-tech and technology. It's an ethical problem. And most of the people say, if it's not my decision, kill him. I don't want to be killed. Otherwise, I will not drive the car. And I say, great. Now it's a couple with the kids. Who are you going to kill, them or yourself? And same thing with cyber. If you are attacked by cyber, can you retaliate with normal? All the issues that we are used to work as high-tech people dealing with the high-tech, Suddenly you need answers. By the way, and the reason is not because you like ethics. It's because the next time somebody will give litigation against you, you'll find out that your algorithm was wrong. It's going to cost you billions of dollars. And I believe the University of Haifa is there. And last but not least, Ellen Kay, my friend. He came from Xerox Park. For those of you who do not know Xerox Park or Ellen Kay, Ellen Kay invented the mouse that Steve Jobs stole. Ellen Kay invented the icons that Steve Jobs stole. But I'm not underestimating Steve Jobs, he's great, and he actually took the invention, make it innovation. But Ellen Kay says one thing, he said the best way to predict the future is to invent it. In an exponential world, there's no way to know what will happen five, ten years from now. I remember in 2003 when we were designing Centrino, which started the revolution, also to the notebook, we say something very funny. We asked people, what do you want? And everybody told us, we want a cable, that can take the download, the data faster. We say, no, no, you'll have Wi-Fi. You will not go to hotel. We've been the joke of the industry. Nobody asked the Wi-Fi. And we went with the Wi-Fi. We've been joke of the industry. And after three years, there was 95% attachment to every computer to Wi-Fi. And people ask us, how did you know that everybody would, would like to have Wi-Fi? And the answer was, we didn't know. We couldn't predict the future. We created the future. And I believe the same thing of the university, our job collectively, Ron, Gustavo, myself, the management part and the academic part, is to try to invent a better future, a better future for the academic, because we need to excel as academic research, a better, student, a better future for our students, and a better future for the State of Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Advocate Bashar Fahum Jayusi gave her report to this board for the first time last year as chairman of the control committee. Like our other honorary officers, she brings with her huge experience. It's a pleasure to invite Advocate Fahum Jayusi to the stage.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, after these talks about vision and hope, I will hope you'll bear with me a little um, a small linear report. So yeah, management should be happy about that if we slack off with our job. That's so it's, it's OK that we're. Um, Professor Alfred Talbert, Chairman of the Board of Governors, Mr. Muldi Adan, uh, Chairman of the Executive Committee, Professor Ron Rubin, President, distinguished members of the Board of Governors, faculty administrative staff, dear friends. Since we last met, the controller unit set off to implement the work plan we presented last year that included several in-depth inspections. These resulted to date in two major control reports. The first, the first is the report on suitable and equal representation of women, minorities, and people with disabilities in the administrative staff. And the second is the report dealing with the implementation of the guidelines of the Director of Wages Department in the Ministry of Finance. I will share with you briefly the summary of these important reports. The report on suitable and equal representation touched on three issues. First, gender representation. Second is minorities representation. And third is representation of people with disabilities. As to gender representation, the findings showed that women form the vast majority of the administrative staff in all employment levels, with the one yet meaningful exception of personal contract senior management executives, where within the total of five personally appointed positions, only one position is held by a woman. I would also like to note that in this inspection of the various employment arrangements for women administrative employees found that they exceed the bars set by law and equal, if not sometimes even beneficial, to those acceptable in the public sector. As to minorities' representation, the total percentage of Arab uh, administrative employees rose from around 3.6% in the year of 2000, 2013 to around 5.15% in, in 2016. The rise was due to the policy adopted by the university's management, the Human Resources Department, and the Vice President and Director General, Mr. Baruch Marzan, to enhance diversity in new recruitments of employees and in setting annual operational objectives to that end. The conclusions of the report indicate that there are real and meaningful efforts invested towards attaining equal representation and in implementing affirmative action hiring practices. Yet, these efforts need to be enhanced, and some modifications are required in that process in order to overcome some of the objective obstacles that were detected. Our recommendations include designating jobs for Arabs and establishing proper registration within the boundaries of law of the employee's origin in order to enable effective follow-up on the status of diverse employment. Another conclusion is adding the Ethiopian population to the entitled groups of suitable representation and affirmative action. I was pleased to read that uh, this issue was directly addressed in the President's annual report this year. Uh, Ron reasserted in his report the university's commitment to affirmative action, and he reported that this year, the rate of recruitment of minority members to university staff rose to 17% as compared with 7% in, previous, in the previous year. The control report, as forementioned, also related to suitable representation of people with disabilities, a duty set directly by law. It was found that due to difficulties in registration and listing of employees with disabilities, it is hard to obtain precise data that can enable us to examine whether the university upholds the standards and bars set by the law. Our recommendations include the appointment of an, administrate, an, 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 sorry, an administrator in charge of the employment of people with disabilities, the inception and implementation of um, a plan to increase the hiring of candidates with disabilities, and mapping the existing employees and updating their personal files with the relevant data. A general recommendation was to submit semi-annual reports to the executive committee on the rate of employment of women, minorities, and people with disabilities. Moving on to the second major control report this year, the report on the implementation of the guidelines of the Director of Wages Department in the Ministry of Finance. 
In this report, the controller office examined whether the employment conditions and agreements of relevant senior management executives and positions in the university, referred to by the guidelines, were comparable with the set of rules that were enforced by the Director of Wages Department in the Ministry of Finance. To clarify the background a little bit, I will briefly say that for a long time, the universities in Israel held the position that these guidelines do not apply to them, and they have undertaken legal action that lasted for several years and ended in a Supreme Court decision that found the guidelines also binding for university staff. The control report examined the employment conditions of all positions referred to in the guidelines. While in the overall, the finding was that the university accommodated to the guidelines, the controller unit found that there were discrepancies in a few cases and violations in one. The conclusions and recommendations demand that the university remedies the discrepancies in accordance to the guidelines and suggest favorable action in order to ensure future conformity. The preparation of this report naturally was complex since it touched on sensitive issues and positions. This was to be expected given the retrospective appliance of the guidelines that inherently meant in many ways the interference in already existing work relations and employment agreements, some of which dating back for more than a decade ago. Yet the issue was handled skillfully, professionally, with a lot of care and respect, and I commend the comproral and the staff for this. I also want to praise the units involved for their collaboration with the deliberations of the um, committee. It was not an easy ride. There, these were some stormy waters, but somehow we managed to sail through them. We had the ears and the cooperation of the management, the president's office, and the executive committee that responded promptly to the control committee's recommendations with some work less left to do before we can close this report. Last but not least, I am glad to inform you that since our last meeting, we were able to close this year three of the six remaining old control reports, some of which dating back several years ago, and made headway with the last three. In addition, we have a comprehensive report underway concerning the Carmel Haifa University Economic Co Cooperation. During this annual meeting, you will get to know a little bit closer uh, about Carmel, and we will be sure to share our findings with you next year. In addition, during the past year, the controllers unit uh, dealt with the complaints received through the anonymous complaint digital box and other channels, and obviously with follow-ups on open reports. I wish to thank the University Controller Unit, CPA Ms. Miki Peretz, and her de deputy, uh, Attorney Zohar Nakhshan, for their work. Also, my thanks go to uh, the devoted Ms. Esti Becker, our com competent committee coordinator. And of course, I wish to extend my deepest gratitude to my fellow members of the Control Committee for their devotion and contribution. Dr. Avigdor Zonenstein, Attorney Benny Baratz, Professor Garrach de Levine, Professor Kobe Rosenblum, CPA Pini Lahat, and Attorney Shulamit Ashbol. Again, this year our annual meeting coincides with the uh, month of Ramadan. And in that spirit, I leave you with the traditional greeting of Ramadan Karim. Thank you. We are in good hands. Thank you very, very much. I have to make an apology. Um, in the announcement for the new uh, members of the Board of Governors, uh, I inadvertently uh, forgot to mention Mr. Don Burris. Uh, would you kindly stand? There he is. Thank you and welcome aboard. What do you think? Should we end the first half? Look, come on along. Okay, just to say that this brings the first part of this plenary to a close. After the break, we look forward to President Ron Robbins' report, the academic prizes, and your chance to question the senior team in Q&A session. So stay tuned, and we'll begin again at 11. Thank you. We'd like to welcome you all back. Please take your seats.
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. We'd like to begin. Welcome back, guests, friends, and faculty, and a special welcome to all the It's my pleasure to invite Rector Professor Mesh to present the prizes.
Chairman of the Board of Governors, Professor Alfred Tauger, President of Executive Committee, Mr. Muli Eden, President of the University, Professor Ron Rodin. It is a, a very important moment for our university now. The university mission is academic excellence, and in order to achieve this excellence, I believe we should provide all the means so our faculty and students can translate their human and intellectual potential into excellence in teaching as in research. The Rector's Prize for Outstanding Researchers provides recognition and a small amount for research support. This year, this amount comes from the Rector budget and I hope that the members of the Board of Governors will join us next year and support this effort as well. The Prize for Outstanding Young Researchers recognizes academics at the start of a successful career that have shown innovation, excellence, and impact in their research. The, the, 20, the 2017 winners are Dr. Mayan Akmon of the Cheryl Spencer Department of Nursing and Dr. Tali Cristal of the Department of Sociology. Mayan Akmon and then Tali. Congratulations to both of you. The Rector Prize for an Outstanding Senior Researcher recognizes academic achievement over the years. Professor Anna Sfart of the Faculty of Education is the winner this year. <clears throat> Professor Sfart has made an, an outstanding contribution in the field of learning sciences, thinking, and communication, and mathematical thinking. Her book, Thinking as Communicating, Human Development, the Growth of Discourses and Mathemizing, Cambridge University Press is widely cited and provides an innovative framework, cognitive as a new paradigm for thinking about thinking. We recognize her innovative studies and her scholarship that is widely cited in her field. Unfortunately, unfortunately she's abroad on an academic trip but we will send our congratulations to her. <laughs> the power of a good teacher is a very rare skill. The winner this year for outstanding teaching is Professor Taisir Elias of the Department of Music. At the moment, he is in Argentina with the Jewish Arab Orchestra. Actually, yesterday, they perform at the biggest theater in Buenos Aires, the Teatro Colón, together with performances from Argentina in a very important event of uh, multiculturalism and embracing all their religions. We congratulate him on his work in this wonderful win. Professor Elias is a gifted musician both in Western and Eastern music. He's the musical director of the Arab Jewish Youth Orchestra. And this year, the Rector Prize recognizes his outstanding contributions to teaching in the Department of Music. Thank you and congratulations. And finally, the last prize honors both our young researchers and the support of our friends around the world. The Miller family has sponsored outstanding young academics, young academics here for over a decade. Their recognition and financial support 
allowed winners to build promising careers. In fact, the rector of the university was himself a winner of the prize in 1997. This year, it's a special pleasure to, annou to announce a winner from the Faculty of Law, the 2017 Dusty and Etty Miller Fellowship for Outstanding Young Scholars goes to my friend and colleague, Dr. Karin Karmitjefet. It's my pleasure to invite you up. Dr. Yefet will also be giving thanks after she receives the prize. Tammy, how can I talk after you with such the finest British accent? <laughs> so forgive me for my truly Israeli accent. But guys, we have a cause for celebration. All the winners for excellence in research are women. <laughs> so I'm very, very happy and excited about it. Um, so good morning and shalom everyone. My name is Karin Karmit Yefet, and I'm a researcher at the law school and also a newlywed. Uh, <laughs> so I was hoping that, you know, uh, the ceremony would not uh, fall on the day of my wedding after that, because I told my fiance that we would need to postpone the wedding. Uh, <laughs> so I'm glad there was not any clash. Okay, I have two minutes, so let's begin. So, I did not have the most uh, conducive upbringing for academic and professional uh, success. I was born and raised in a small development town in Emek Betshean, where only few educated role models existed in the community. And yet, despite or perhaps because of this background, I've always been interested in exploring the mechanisms by which disadvantaged groups, and especially women, can break barriers and achieve social mobility. And so in both my capacities as a, a legal scholar and as a feminist social activist, I've been dedicated to employing law in the service of uh, gender equality and women's rights. And my uh, scholarship is primarily focused on the impact of religion on many dimensions of women's lives from uh, feminist, constitutional and comparative uh, perspectives. And my uh, scholarship, I'm glad to say, is especially known for its anti-essentialist nature. That means that it is committed to shattering the social legal invisibility of minority women, that is Muslim women, Mizrahi women, religious women, as well as the most disadvantaged women, from the virgin to the whore, from ultra-Orthodox women to women in prostitution. And the overarching goal of my uh, scholarship is to uh, promote women's equal citizenship status in Israeli law and society. Uh, and please allow me to conclude by extending my deepest gratitude to the Miller family, especially to Ian and Leslie Miller for their um, generous award in memory of their parents, Etty and Dusty Miller, I know the price is called Dusty and Etty Miller, but we will reverse it as it should, Etty and Dusty Miller. Um, and uh, you made me very happy and my parents very proud and I wish you all the good blessings. And also, I'd like to thank my dearest Dean, Professor Oren Gazale Yal, himself a recipient of this prestigious prize for his uh, belief in me and his friendship. And last but not least, I'd like to thank our one and only Professor Gad Barzilai, the Vice Provost, <laughs> and also my previous Dean for his encouragement and support ever since I set foot in the University of Haifa. And to our new rector, who showed his brilliance by uh, nominating uh, Professor Barzilai is his second. Uh, and uh, God bless and toda rabba. Kulchem tavou al abracha. Good morning, everyone. 
I have the urge to sing very interesting. <laughs> oh, my dear. Um, welcome. This is my first Board of Governors meeting as president. It's an exciting moment for me. Uh, today we'll be discussing the president's report. Tomorrow I hope you'll all join us also to hear um, the strategic plan that we have planned that we are going to present to you. It's uh, been a lot of work, a lot of people involved. But uh, I'm going to talk today more or less about a midlife crisis. We're 45 years old, rapidly approaching 50. And the two things that you can do under these circumstances, you can curl up in a corner and weep, or you can look back at achievements in the past, take stock of the present, and start dreaming about the future. So today, that is what we're going to do. We're going to look back at the past, take stock of the, the present, and give you just a very brief glimpse at the future, which we'll be discussing mostly uh, tomorrow. So, without further ado, let's look back for a few moments. 45 years ago at the university. It's amazing to see the contrast that existed at the time. Here it is, 1965. Look at that barren hill just being mauled by a bulldozer, ready for something that we now see in front of our eyes today. It is an amazing achievement. And one, wonder one wonders how that actually happened. In order to understand how it actually happened, I think we should go back and look at the dreamers. And I'm sure you will recognize uh, some of them in, in, that, in that photo. So let's look back at those innocent days at the university at its inception and some of its dreamers. You recognize some of the individuals there. From left to right on the, the, the picture on the right-hand side, you recognize Abba Hushi, Levi Eshkol. There is Elias Raffaeli, who will be, uh, uh, of course, honoring later on in the ceremony. And the man on the right is known, of course, to people from Haifa, that was Davida Cohen, a very, very major member of the Labour Party at the time. But I'm more interested in the people on the left-hand side. They're pointing at something which actually doesn't exist, pointing at to bring an academic vision based on an illustrious academic career. And that puts you on a different uh, sphere, I think. The seeds of the strategic plan that we will be presenting Tomorrow, you planted them, Fred. You planted them in our minds. The idea of expanding beyond this campus, it came from you. Um, you've also been the university's most generous trustee over the years. Your support for the academic program, for the major academic ventures we have here, the American Friends, the Carmel Company, has been transformative. Thank you, Fred. And this, please do not, uh, there, there, are, there are many other people that should be mentioned in the speech. There is the Cardas family who is supporting us very generously over the years, and many other people sitting here in this room who have been incredibly generous with the university. I took the time to, to, to commemorate and to celebrate those who have been with us many, many years. Um, this is not, of course, a slight on anybody, and there are many in this room who support us right now who we'll be talking about, of course, in the, as we move along. So if we're doing so well and everything looks so good, why are we dissatisfied? Um, can, we, can, can, can we do better? Have we fulfilled the potential? Why haven't we been able to fill our potential? That is pretty much going to be um, the story of tomorrow. When we um, move forward, look, this is a, a wonderful picture of... <coughs> Muli, I go back to your comments. Um, this, this room here, um, w when is it from, Libby? From 71. This, this computer room from 71 fits today in a dumb phone, not even a smartphone. Um, it's today, this microscope on, on the right has more computing power than this whole room over there. Um, we've moved ahead, but we haven't moved ahead perhaps at the pace that we'd like. And so what we'll be talking about tomorrow uh, as we move forward is the future. Um, 
the multiversity. And I'm going to give you a little glimpse of what we're going to be talking about tomorrow as we move forward. Look at these pieces of the puzzle uh, fitting in there. You can see the university's expansion. It will be expanding to the port area. It will be expanding um, to a, a, an art school down downtown Haifa to Rambam Hospital where you see the glass tower deep into the ocean and all the way into um, the Western Galilee towards Kalmiel. Um, to give you a glimpse of what we'll be doing tomorrow, we'd like to show you a small, a small clip. Thank you. So, so, I think what you saw in that little clip is an institution that is determined to punch above its weight, to reach for the stars, to do what pretty much is impossible. I take I take inspiration from a, a, a little story that happened here at the university two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, um, the University of Haifa won the Intercollegiate Basketball Championship against all odds. We were nothing but a pickup game a couple of years ago. And by sheer determination, and I see some of the people involved in the sports sitting at the back there. By sheer determination, this team beat every single college and university in the country, and that is what we're going to do as well. We're going to punch above our weights. <laughs> but to go back to Fred's message, it's going to take a whole village to accomplish this. We can't do it by ourselves, neither Gustavo, nor Muli, nor myself, nor any of the deans, nor any of the faculty sitting in this room can do it by ourselves. We can only do it with you. To raise a university, it takes a whole village, and um, you too, like those people at the very beginning of my presentation who are planting a tree, we call upon you too to plant a tree that the next generation is going to use, not us. We're not going to be in that shade. It's going to be the next generation. And we have set ourselves a very ambitious goal for fundraising. You did not want to mention the number, Fred, but I think I will. Yeah, we set ourselves a goal of $250 million before we turn 50. And I promise you tomorrow, when we present the strategic plan and how we intend to fund it, you will see that this is an attainable goal. We can be a much better place than we are. We can be game changers for Israeli society. We'll all do it together. I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to the rest of the board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, for Pro Professor Robin. In a moment, we'll have an opportunity for questions, but there are a couple of short procedural items. First, may I call upon Professor Tauber to conduct the ratification of the 2016-2017 budget framework, the 2016 financial statements, and appointing the auditors. Please note, board members have been sent relevant papers in advance. You may recall last year we requested comments about the Board of Governors meeting, how it might be improved, and uh, we took those uh, responses seriously and decided that instead of having the committee meetings, we would distribute the reports in the hopes that they would be read at your leisure and that we would then uh, have a question and answer period about the, about the reports in particular, and then finally a ratification uh, as called for by the bylaws. So there are uh, essentially um, uh, three items that we need to talk about. The ratification of the financial statements of the university as of September 30th, 2016. Ratification of the budget framework for the 2016-17 academic year and the appointment of the university auditor. Are there any comments in regards to these ratifications?
If there are no comments, I suggest that someone move that we ratify. Ron, second. Gustavo. I ask only members of the board to vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those who oppose, any abstentions, unanimously uh, ratified. Thank you very much. Um, we, I think, have the opportunity to have a question and answer period uh, between uh, the board and the uh, administrative and academic leadership of the university. And I invite President, the Rector, and uh, the Chairman of the Executive Committee to join me up here. Uh, please. Yariv. Have I forgotten anyone? Okay. Okay. Questions and answers to the uh, administrative and faculty and managerial leadership. I have questions. I'll just do it to provoke a conversation. Baruch, yeah. we have a master plan which is due this summer. How are we doing? After five years of uh, uh, process, the master plan is now in the regional committee. And uh, I think that uh, in August, uh, we get the approval of the master plan. So until now, we have no uh, objections. And uh, the master plan approved by the municipality of Haifa, municipality of Nesher, and uh, the forest guard, etc. It's OK until now. So we believe that in August, uh, we have the approval. The master plan is a condition to build a dormitories. So uh, we need to approve it to start with the beginning of the dormitories. We approve by the PBC, the VATAT, to add 500 uh, beds. And uh, after the approval, we go to the tender. Will you distribute the master plan to the board once it's approved? My question is, will you distribute the master plan to the board? Can you put it into a form so that the Board of Governors can see? After the approval, we, we distribute the master plan to the board, yes. OK, thank you. Any questions about the master plan or the facilities report? I would ask our rector to comment on the uh, Oh, oh, there is a question. Great. Please. The, 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 question, the question is, is a balanced budget an objective of the university? If you read in the... And the, the documents, the budget is balanced. Yeah, but I think the question regards uh, perhaps the strategic plan. As we move forward, uh, this very ambitious plan uh, is based on, uh, on, on two, two, two legs. One is raising private money, and the other is uh, government support through VATAT, which you'll hear about tomorrow. Uh, the university cannot, even by law, uh, operate under a deficit budget. We have to have a balanced budget, and all of these moves are predicated on having the necessary resources to actually execute them. Um, so that's the long and the short, really. We are not in a position at all 
to have a, a, a anything but a balanced budget. Any other questions in this regard? By the way, the board should know that any question I ask uh, has not been uh, pre-rehearsed, so they're not prepared for anything no, no. I have to <laughs> <Yeah>, say. <not. laughs> um, okay, I'd like to turn to the rector's report. Um, Gustavo, uh, the report is rich with uh, unstated uh, uh, comment, and I'd like you to uh, amplify uh, the point made on page five where you write, the share of the University of Haifa in the research model increased in the decade 2007 to 17 by approximately 60 percent, the highest rate of growth among all the universities. And the question is, how do you intend to either increase that rate of growth or at least maintain it? Uh, thank you, Fred. Uh, our goal is to increase the rate of growth and increase our share in the uh, research uh, budget of the uh, government. One of the first steps that we took together with the Vice President of Research, uh, Professor uh, Ido Itzhaki, was to develop a new policy of supporting and encouraging research of our uh, colleagues. And we have already implemented a very comprehensive policy of incentive to increase uh, our role in research. Uh, the second thing is continuing, and probably the first one, is continuing all the time recruiting outstanding young researchers and providing to them new laboratories with the cost that is uh, involved in that. Uh, and the third point, and it's also very important, you usually don't speak about that, is to retain the excellent researchers that we have because we live in an ecology of competition. And we are jumping in that competition this year. In October, we'll start three new researchers at the University of Haifa that we actually have stolen from other universities in Israel. Um, and the <clears throat> And we also have other achievements that I didn't mention in the report because we're later on. One of them that I think that goes directly to the statement of, of Ron that we are going to win is that this year uh, in the competition for new members of the Young Academy of Sciences in Israel, in that competition three new members are from the University of Haifa out of seven new members. As you probably know, as you probably know, in Israel there are seven universities. So if Haifa gets three members there, it means that a couple of universities this year got none, <laughs> and, uh, which is actually true. I mean, only three universities got, got representatives this year, the University of Haifa, the University of Tel Aviv, and the University of Jerusalem and the others were not in the, in the competition. So the answer is we, are, we created a comprehensive policy of incentives, recruiting new excellent faculty members, and it is tough in the competition, and retaining the best ones. Thank you. You're not finished, Gustavo. No, no, no. But the e-learning is something I'd like to uh, uh, comment on and have you uh, amplify. I think it was two maybe it was three years ago, I'm forgetting, we devoted a fair amount of effort uh, to discussing uh, distance learning, computer-based learning as the, uh, the future. And I note that we are growing in this regard. Um, the number of students registered for partial and full online courses uh, this year is over 11,000, uh, which is almost double what it was uh, in 2012, and I'm curious as to how much of the e-learning uh, will be uh, developed uh, as part of a strategic uh, growth of the university, how much more can we do, and how much resources do we need to develop it? Well, uh, for one thing, I have to say that I'm very sensitive to uh, 
computer-based or e-learning, because I used to be in the past one of the first chairs of the steering committee of that uh, unit. We need to develop a plan, and we are doing that, to increase the size of the unit. It is an outstanding unit that really accomplish excellent things, but it needs to be expanded so he can make better things and much more things. Yet, it is considered to be one of the best, if not the best, in the country. And uh, it is also, e-learning, it is also part of the strategic program of the Council of Higher Education. We have already uh, participated in two competitions for the developing of, for development of e-learning classes, uh, both global and both national. And uh, in that competition, in the first round, we got uh, one winner, and we are now waiting for the results of the second competition. So what we are doing now is, first of all, creating an infrastructure of uh, lecturers that prepare programs for e-learning courses that can compete in these competitions because they are going to be every six months. So we have out of the shelf programs to uh, uh, support, to submit to the competition of the Council of National Education that also provides the funds for the development of the courses. And we are at this point in the middle of de developing a new policy that has academic part but also budgeting parts. So Ron is also involved in that uh, big effort to develop a master plan for three, four years, where are we going with e-learning, what we need, and how we are going to implement that. Thank you. Yes, Sharon. The question was directed at Gustavo regarding the status of the international student program. Yes. Um, right from the beginning of my uh, position, I uh, nominated uh, Professor Gadbar Zilai from the, that was the Dean of the Faculty of Law as the Vice Rector in charge of international programs. And he's actually heading the International School of the University. We are in many uh, ways expanding the number of international students. We are working with our partners in China to bring more students from China. Uh, I have been in a visit of the President of Israel with uh, uh, um, uh, members of higher education in India, and we are starting to develop plans with them. We are going to have many visits now. And personally, I came back from Argentina two weeks ago where I signed an agreement with the rabbinical seminar of, Ameri of Latin America uh, in which they will send to us students for a, to get a an undergraduate degree in the history of the Jewish people. Uh, that will give us a, another a, a area in the world where we can bring students. In general, our policy is restricted to improve the recruitment for MA programs all over the world, from the Jewish communities, but also from India and China. Increase the number of doctoral and postdoctoral students, and we are creating facilities for that. And there is some achievements already this year as I heard, the enrollment to our international programs has increased by 20 to 30 percent. Um, some of the programs are really very strong, and they uh, have the life of themselves also. There was another question. Yes.
Thank you for the correction. So before we adjourn, we will re-address the question of the auditor as a resolution, as a forum. But the, the, but the, but the more salient point is that uh, this format, uh, the implicit criticism is that there is not enough opportunity for interchange between the management and the committee and the board of governors. Well, all I can say at this point is that we have, according to the schedule, an hour to discuss whatever you want. So I invite you to address anyone with any question. Manfred. There's a person missing at the table, the vice president for finance or the chief financial officer. Uh, so what is the situation? It, it is an important matter to be dealt with. Ron. Um, thank you for that question, Manfred. Uh, we have made some structural changes at the university. And uh, those structural changes um, include changing uh, the nature of the CFO, of the Chief Financial Officer, who, um, with the departure of Mr. Shuki Shai, we now have a new financial, a ch Chief Financial Officer who is a, um, a deputy to Baruch and reports to me as well. His name is Michael Wiener, and I wonder if he's in the room and he'll yeah. stand up. Michael is also here, and will, uh, any questions that neither Baruch nor I can answer, he will, he will provide us with the response. Uh, this is part of our effort to, to streamline the university uh, and make it more efficient. Um, there will be other um, deputies appointed in the future. As we move forward and uh, our expansion plan becomes a reality, we need a machine that works uh, a little bit more efficiently than perhaps the previous way we organized management. This was passed by the Executive uh, Council, of course. Uh, this was not just a, a management or an administrative decision. Other questions? Sonia. Um, I would like to know and hear something maybe about the you gave this uh, review of the past and the present and the future. Um, some of us who come from Europe, uh, we've heard a lot about China, about India, of course, uh, US, um, and so on. How has research cooperation actually developed, let's say, with major European universities? And uh, do you see a future in there? Do you see an influence, let's say, of the BDS? Um, efforts in Europe and the okay. maybe the fading okay, sympathy um, yeah, and problems in the academic area and where is it in the future in terms of uh, collaboration with European academic institutions are you happy about it or there are areas where uh, are problems and where we can help maybe so l let me let me try and explain the, the policy for for international collaborations we work on our strengths and our strengths happen to be in two places right now. They happen to be in China. We have robust uh, academic collaborations. Uh, one university, East China Normal, in Shanghai. We have our own building on, 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 uh, on the outskirts of that campus where we'll be doing collaborative research. We will have doctoral students that we share with this university with another Chinese entity. This is um, the Chinese Academy of Science. We'll have 10 students coming, perhaps as early as next year, to study here at the university, perhaps to take not even a joint degree, but a University of Haifa degree. Um, and that is only the beginning. China is bursting at its seams. The amount of money pouring into education in China is staggering, and we are poised to have the necessary collaborations that will help us move forward as a university. That's an area of strength. And the area of strength is born out of the fact that um, some of us, definitely myself, have very robust ties in China and making those connections is, is not as, as daunting as it may sound to people who have no idea how Chinese academia works. The other area where many of us have a, a, a great amount of strength is collaboration uh, in, with certain American universities, universities in the United States, 
Um, we have a very robust collaboration dating back to um, when, when Amos and, and David were uh, uh, heading the institution, that is with Texas A&M, that continues. We're beginning now a, a relationship with NYU for obvious reasons, um, given my background. And there are other places as well that we will be working with in the future. I must say that with the exception of the Erasmus program, um, the connections with, with Europe are not nearly as strong as the connections with either the United States or with China. As far as BDS, uh, and, and the question is, is this related to BDS? Uh, I'll say the following. I don't think, and I mentioned this in the article, if some of you read in the Jerusalem Post, I think that the official BDS now is contained. Uh, it is not growing, at least, but it's definitely contained. But the great, the great danger is the unofficial BDS. It's the person who will just not respond, or the person who will just not sit in the doctoral committee, or will take the article submitted to a journal and not even open it and throw it away. This is much more difficult to, um, to combat, and I would say, and this is a, a generalization, but never a generalization with, with some validity, that the unofficial BDS is alive and kicking in many parts of Europe less so in the United States and definitely non-existent in China. So yes, there is a, 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 an issue that we have to respond to. Um, uh, Mark Yudoff, who I hope will be here tomorrow, may be able to, to enlighten us a little bit. I don't think he's in the audience today. Um, <clears throat> the effort in the United States to contain BDS is, is I think, working pretty well. In Europe, it is a bit, a bit more of a challenge. I just want to add to that that it's not that the university is not uh, collaborating in terms of research with Europe. We participate in all the programs of the uh, European uh, Social Research Council, uh, Science Council. We also continue collaborating with uh, binational programs like the DIP and the uh, GIF. And of course, that many of our researchers have links with Europe. Uh, but uh, this is more at the level of uh, uh, researchers oriented. Please. My name is Zaidan Atashi. I have been following and involved in the university for a very long time. Most of the Arab students are studying at the University of Haifa for many years. Most of the Arab population are living in Northern Triangle and Northern Israel. The number of the Arab students has been in, in the increase for many years, but the involvement of the Arab community in the Galilee are in the decrease in the affairs of the university. I think there is a very, an, or an excellent potential among the Arab community in the North to be involved in the university. Financially, intellectually, industrialists, lawyers, physicians, to be a part of the decision-making process or to find the mechanism to draw the Arab community in the North to be involved in the university and members of this uh, very respectful uh, 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 board of governors. There is a great potential among the Arabs and I hope that you, it is a proposal that I mentioned to, to Professor Rubin two weeks ago, we cannot continue to neglect the Arab community and only to accept Arab students. We have the Arab leaders to be involved here, businessmen, everyone. And I think that the university can find the mechanism how to approach the Arab community in Northern Israel to be potentially active at the university and its development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zaydan. We've spoken about this before, of course. And I, 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 we, we fully acknowledge that we can do a better job. We should be doing a better job than we do right now. And as we move in a more forceful manner into the north of the country and we establish um, a foothold, at least one foothold in the immediate future, outside of Haifa and in the north, um, th that comment will resonate as we, as we move forward. I will say this in general, um, we would definitely um, hope to find uh, um, among uh, the, 
the, the, the Arab leadership, many of them, um, some of them on our board, but not all, uh, enough, obviously, uh, contributors, both financially and with their time, to this effort. There's no doubt about it. I will take this opportunity to, to let the members of the board know here that for the very first time, we have a group of uh, Palestinian Americans who openly uh, support the university financially. In the past, we've had uh, Palestinians living in the diaspora supporting the university in one way or another, but usually in a very um, clandestine fashion. What has happened now is for the very first time, a very large group of Arab Americans living in the Chicago area have come here to the university and, 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 and announced publicly and published this in Arab American newspapers their support for this university. I see this as a tremendous step and one which might encourage um, those who can afford it, of course, among the Arab community here in Israel to join forces and become contributors and so that next time when we acknowledge uh, those who support us, there will be among them, of course, um, people from um, uh, the Arab community in Israel as well. So, but we do acknowledge, to go back to the beginning of this, we acknowledge the point that you make, Zidane. Actually, please. My name is Baij Mansour. I would like to, uh, to ask Professor Ron again about the BDS, the boycott. Uh, this issue is very important to the state of Israel for the academy in, the, in Israel. Uh, as the University of Haifa, that uh, they have a lot of professors from the Arab community, not so much, and also a lot of students, the issue of uh, the involve of the minorities here, it's very important to introduce to the international community, especially with the academy. I think the university can be a model for these uh, things, to introduce it to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or other institution, and to try to be part how to defeat uh, this boycotting of the BDS. I hope that you can take initiative with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or other institution. That's one question. Uh, please. Yeah, sure. I, I must say that I'm somewhat frustrated. I've, I've spoken to the ambassador at the UN uh, and other people who, who lead the effort abroad, and it is uh, somewhat frustrating that we're not used uh, as a role model to, to refute the fundamental tenets of, of BDS. It, it strikes me always as a, a, a great mystery why we're not used more often, um, but we will make extra efforts um, uh, to do this. Um, I'm not quite sure why we're not used that often, I must say. I would like to get back to the point that was made earlier. We'll return I have another uh, point, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, another uh, thing, uh, we, we met with Professor Gustavo with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, two seminars. I hope that uh, Professor Gustavo and Dr. Uh, Karmit can uh, speak about uh, the status of the women here and able people. Uh, this uh, kind of uh, collaboration can uh, give the, the opportunity to the University of Haifa to be in the front of uh, many development that Israel need uh, to introduce. Thank you. Go ahead. I don't know. Maish, what was the question? It's uh, not a question. I'm uh, asking you t if you can introduce the activity that uh, we made it uh, uh, with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Affairs about the human rights and the issue of the women's status and unable people that we going to do next week and we may, what we made it in uh, uh, this uh, Sunday. Ah, okay. We are, uh, Baish is referring to a very uh, important collaboration between uh, us and the uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has to provide two reports on the state of civil rights in Israel, one of them on the state of uh, gender rights in Israel and the second on disabilities, disability rights in Israel. And these uh, uh, two uh, evaluations are actually the result of a meeting, 
and one was already happened here on, on gender rights, uh, between the uh, civil society, the government, and the academia. So we have the first meeting was last week on gender rights that was co-hosted by the University of Haifa, and the next one is on disabilities that will be also at the University of Haifa. And Baish has been very instrumental in helping us to bring the Ministry of, of Foreign, Foreign Affairs uh, here uh, to discuss these issues. Uh, we, our policy of the university is the university as a pluralistic university. We really do a very huge effort uh, to increase the rights of all the groups uh, um, and to provide to all the groups the possibility to expand uh, their pot potential. I think that one of the things that uh, maybe Ron didn't mention, I think that the story of this university is the story of university in which people from different disadvantaged backgrounds found a home and really translate uh, these capabilities in excellence and I think that uh, Karin is the last example, but we have at the very beginning of the university other examples like uh, uh, Professor Sami Smoha, like uh, Professor uh, Asher Kuriat, uh, that were probably uh, as Oriental professors or Eastern professors, Sephardi professors, uh, could get easily a job at the University of Haifa and much less easy in other places. Uh, the same regarding our professors. I think that uh, um, I really feel a little bit embarrassed to mention, fi mention Faisal because Faisal actually was nominated and, and what got the, the, the job of a dean le in complete legitimate terms, not because and not despite, just because he's, he's a very capable person. But uh, nobody stopped that, and nobody even think that uh, that we have to uh, have a, a different person. And I think that one of the very, very, very uh, uh, examples of the position of our university was today. Um, although it is the rector prize, but I was not involved in the nomination and the election of the rector's prize. It was a committee a university committee made up of uh, professors of the university that went through each nomination after the other. And as you say, as you can see, in this university this year, our best researchers are women, and our best uh, uh, teaching, uh, excellent teacher is an Arab, and that was just uh, because they are, they are excellent. Is it relevant to this particular issue? Because I want to make a comment. The, um, I take very seriously your point. And the question that I'm uh, struggling with now is how best to address it in a serious way. Moodley, should the executive committee undertake a uh, examination of how the university is integrating itself with the Arab community and how it might improve, or should this be something that should fall under the president's office? I think the Board of Governors would appreciate a uh, evaluation and perhaps a program for increasing the, uh, the uh, integration of the university with the Arab population, especially as we're moving north. Go ahead. The AR, AR in high tech is... The AR, AR in high tech is action required give it to Ron and myself between us, we'll find it the right place to do. And in order to move fast, and we say it's an exponential world, I suggest that you'll get us, the Arab community will start raising funds because we need a lot of money. So in parallel to this, I, we spoke many times about the involvement and how can we get involvement in all aspects. And Ron and myself will try to find what is the right place to put it and come back with, with a plan. Okay. And it would include, I think, development, Yariv. It would be very important, I think. It's been a neglected area. You're absolutely correct. And uh, we must reach out. You want to make a comment, Yarif, on this? I think the president would present tomorrow the master plan for the next five years. And if it falls within the strategy, we need to pick it up. OK. <clears throat> Question. 
perhaps extending this discussion uh, beyond Israeli boundaries. boundaries. Uh, this aspect of pluralism and multicultural um, openness, especially towards the Arab population, can it extend uh, beyond Israeli borders to be a regional hub uh, attracting students from uh, a number of, uh, of Arab countries that uh, would be willing to, uh, to study in, uh, in Haifa? Is that something considered? Um, here we are beholden to politics. Uh, we cannot make these decisions independently. Um, that doesn't mean we're not trying. So I'll just give one example. Uh, over the recent years, there's been a somewhat of a miraculous birth of a private university in Jenin. Um, and uh, it is um, such an incredibly important university that today it attracts thousands and thousands of Israelis to study there, right, Faisal? Thousands. Study in areas that perhaps we don't have here, like uh, uh, pharmacy, pharmaceutical studies, and, uh, and maybe dentistry and other areas like this. This is not to mention the thousands of Israelis studying in Jordan. So, um, yeah, we need to reach out to our neighbors. We are restrained and constrained by politics, but I think it's also somewhat um, disturbing that we're not able to provide these opportunities to many of our own citizens who now go to neighboring countries to study these fields. Uh, once upon a time, when politics looked a little different, there were students here. Um, I remember well, and this is not the case right now. Um, uh, not even students uh, from the Palestinian territories. Um, I, I, I think we're making baby steps with this university in Janine, and we'll see where this leads us to. I'd like to return to uh, the academic report. Yarif, we're going to do you a little bit later uh, some questions directed towards development. But um, Gustavo, I'm intrigued with the, uh, how should I put it, the potential of improving the academic excellence of our student body. And uh, what, in your view, is the most appropriate strategy for attracting the best students in Israel to come here? <coughs> we are doing many steps uh, in the recruitment today, in these days. One of them, uh, we are um, offering uh, scholarships for students that uh, uh, enroll in our university with a very high grade in the psychometric exam, even if they are shifting or moving from another institution. Uh, so that's one avenue of scholarships. The second avenue, we are offering a program for excellent students in which they can complete in two years a, a BA degree that combines a one a, a department in the social sciences and one in the humanities. And the program has been advertised only recently we got the uh, approval of the board, the, the Council of Higher Education. It is uh, two years, but six semesters, which means that they will study very intensively also in the summer. And I think that this program will be very attractive to uh, very- Is that unique to Haifa? Yes, at this point, uh, as far as I know, yes. There are some colleges that offer the same program, but not the same high quality and not the same, the, the same uh, commitment to excellence as we have. Um, so these are the two things, and we are still doing a lot of thinking of how to attract better students uh, to our university. Let's talk for a moment about the legal clinics, Tammy. Do you want to comment? There, there are two paragraphs in the rector's report on the clinical on the law clinics. I think the board would be interested to know the status of that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's 
wasn't on my cards, but I'm no, this very This is unrehearsed. To. That's fine. <laughs> yes. uh, so thank you. Uh, the legal clinics, uh, we have eight legal clinics at uh, the law faculty. We have 100 students uh, studying them in each, each year. Um, as I mentioned before, we have uh, clinics that span women's rights, Arab Palestinian minority rights, education rights, elderly rights. We have a law and technology clinic, a very unique uh, clinic that deals with ethical questions uh, concerning technology that we heard a bit about before. Um, we have um, a public defenders clinic, and did I forget anybody? Oh, and a general human rights clinic that does uh, disability rights and housing rights. Um, since the beginning of this year, we, uh, the legal clinics underwent a very a significant change in which our lawyers, we have, each legal clinic has a lawyer that does the uh, legal work with the students. Um, uh, so from the beginning of this year, thanks to a very um, swift and determined uh, work by President um, uh, Robin and, and uh, Professor Gustavo Mesh and um, all the other members, uh, of the leadership of the university. Uh, the clinics underwent a change in which the lawyers went up to 100% um, um, uh, working hours and a very significant also raise in their salaries, which put us in the first row with other universities in Israel. Uh, since this process, we have seen an amazing, really, I can't tell you how uh, dramatic the change has been in terms of the activities of the clinics. We are able to do so much more, both in terms of legal education uh, and the service we can give our students, the mentoring, the discussions, the theorizing about uh, uh, law and about the legal actions that they do, and both in terms of the actual legal activities that we do. We teach, we uh, deal with many hundreds of cases of real clients, uh, mostly from uh, um, uh, discriminated groups and disadvantaged groups in Israel, especially in the north, but also from, uh, from around the country. Uh, we have uh, uh, put forward uh, about 15 big legal cases to courts, many uh, uh, legislative amendments, lots of policy reports, and of course, just uh, dealing with small individual cases uh, of clients from all uh, around Israeli society. Are there questions for Tammy? No? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes. It's uh, not a political uh, uh, issue, but uh, there is a big problem in the Golan Heights. Uh, the civil wars uh, in Syria continue. And the student uh, who studied before in uh, Damascus, they are not uh, allowed to go there. And the most of the student trying to find a uh, place to study. And they, unfortunately, the, um, the Malag and the, and the other inst academic institution in Israel, they are not understanding the situation of these students. And they are trying to find another places. And they are running to Europe and the other places to study there. My question, maybe the University of Haifa with the Malag and other institutions can find a um, plan how to absorb students. We're talking about hundreds of students can be studied here in the university. And I think uh, there can be a plan coming from this university. So we don't have a foreign policy. We're a university in this country and we have to follow the lead of, of the government in this, in, in this particular issue. There, there have been issues here. Let me just mention, tomorrow we will be talking about Rambam. Rambam and Naharia and other hospitals in Sfat as well have been opening their doors uh, to, to many of the wounded uh, in the Syrian conflict. They get no government support. They get zero. The government pays the hospital for each and every patient that gets to the hospital, they get zero for their support for these, this human tragedy happening just along our borders over here. Um, we're not in a situation where we can do this without support. And if we get zero support from the government, I don't see how we can do this. On the other hand, let's have a bright note here. There is an institution that we will start working with in the future to, to help them if possible. 
It's called the University of the People. It's an online university. Uh, and it's a, very, it's a very good one. And it's run out of the United States by somebody called Shai Reshef, who's an, an Israeli entrepreneur. And um, they, we have not discussed this yet among ourselves, but they've asked us <clears throat> for assistance in providing professors for online courses, uh, for administrative issues, and probably that's the best way we can, we can assist. We cannot have our own foreign policy. It doesn't work. And you're, an, you're an, a diplomat, and I'm sure you appreciate that comment. Sonia. Um, yes, I'd just like to ask another question, because we uh, don't have the committees this year. Um, what about the students? Is there anybody here from the students to report to us on the issues and uh, um, developments, and if there are any, uh, so there are many problems students? they have on the mind? Yeah. We because have I, students normally there. there would be a student committee, and uh, so we don't see them, we don't hear so them. So members of the student leadership are in the audience. I don't know if they have okay, any Okay, gentlemen, we would like to have a short summary of the student union, student interests, student concerns. Can one of you give us uh, something? Well, thank you for the opportunity. We didn't expect it. Uh, actually, what we are trying to do this year is uh, finding new ways to talk to our student and to find whatever they want. Um, and we found it to be a lot of events on campus. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, only this year, this is the first year that we took in advance to do two events in a week so more students can take part of them. <coughs> and do you have anything else you want to say? We try to get our students to be more part of the community in Haifa so they can uh, just help and uh, volunteer in all the communities in Haifa. Hi, hello everybody. Um, actually, if someone wants to hear more information, we have a stand out, uh, out of here. So we'll be there to answer questions. Okay. Let Thank me you. just add, for those who don't know, that three members of the student union are members of the university senate and have full voting rights and are full members of the university senate. Therefore, have um, an ability to influence all of our major decisions taking place here at the university. We have a new Dean of Students, by the way, since you raised the issue of students, Jenny, Jenny Coleman, who is a <laughs> Jenny is a professor of psychology and has taken upon herself um, the duties of Dean of Students, and um, of course we wish her all the best, and she's already proven to be somebody who looks like she's been a, a veteran for many years, so thank you, Jenny. Yariv. I have questions, and I'm sure the board has other questions. First of all, let's talk a little bit about donor recognition. Can you remind me, because and everyone else, maybe, I don't know, what the Brenner uh, Maridor Memorial is, and uh, it's under some background? It is under construction. What is it? Uh, For, we presented last year at the committee meeting. There is, it's, it's a try to visualize an open space Next would be multi-purpose building, where you would have, uh, it's difficult for me to explain, like roads or, or parks. It's, it's not even parks, like uh, um, dry, dry rivers was the concept, uh, where along the banks you'd have different uh, categories of donors uh, and different plaques, similar in concept to what we did with the donor's wall at the 700, um, uh, gallery next to the um, library. Uh, it, it is under construction already. Since it, it is a construction site, I advise you not to try and walk yourself through or into the uh, premise. It will be finished in a few months. So the donor garden is under construction. Yes. But I'm asking about the Maridor Memorial. What is that? This is, uh, we have to go back to the Yom Kippur War. And the Brenner Meridor are two families 
who established a very, very generous scholarship fund, uh, which basically it was to commemorate the schoolmates of their own children who uh, died during the Yom Kippur War. And for many, many years, the university is awarding a uh, couple of dozen scholarships a year, as a matter of fact, to worthy students. And we're having a ceremony. And the family used, or the families, plural said, used to come. Children, the grandchildren, friends. What happened over the years, remember it's 1973, people are dying out. And about a year ago, the families came to me and said, we would like to reconsider the entire concept of this annual meeting. How about we would continue with the awarding of the scholarship, but we would cross out, we would have no, cer no annual ceremony anymore with the associated costs, obviously. And instead of that, we'll construct some kind of a memorial site. We would engrave all the names of those fallen soldiers, and uh, this is what we decided to do. Thank you. And where will that be located? I I'm sorry? Where will it be located? In the scenery road. We can show it to you. Yep, that's fine. Okay, so Yarif, tell us about fundraising and your view of how we are doing. Because I see the numbers. I just don't know if you're satisfied with these numbers. I, 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 unfortunately, you're in the business where you never can be satisfied. But that's you answer your own question. <laughs> no, seriously, why don't you give us a perspective on the uh, fundraising? So obviously we are reporting about the previous year. Yeah. We are reporting about the previous year. Every time we've sent the <coughs> folders in advance, those of you who have it, uh, we've compared the two last working years, 2014-15 uh, to 2015-16, and we had an increase of 22% in what we call money in the bank. And we had a total uh, support increase of 15%. I just want to remind you why we have those discrepancies for those who, who are not into the numbers. We have three different categories, the way we book it or the way we report it. Um, and by the way, try to remember the university books it in one way, but the societies, the friends of all over the world, my book might, uh, or as a matter of fact, it's not might, they do book it differently because of local accounting uh, procedures and fiscal year. So when the university uh, is counting their numbers, it's always October 1st through the end of September. It's not January to December or any other system <coughs> that other countries might have. We have uh, three different kind of, uh, if you want, philanthropic dollars that we are considering. The straightforward philanthropy dollars. This is money in the bank. Someone gives a gift. This gift is being transferred to the university. It's being booked and we can report it and identify it one to one. That's the increase of 22% that we had over the last two years. The second category, we call it indirect donations, which means, excuse me, that if someone is helping one of the societies, for instance, and that money is being kept over, overseas, as far as the university is considered, the university is not allowed to book it as a gift within our books, within our fiscal system. But we want to acknowledge the gift and want to acknowledge the society for raising that kind of money. So we book it differently. And last year we have a decrease of 11%. It is not, by the way, it's not big money. We, the difference was $100,000 between those two years globally, just to, to put in perspective. The third, and I think this is a very, very interesting um, portion of our work, and we'll be uh, discussing Carmel on Thursday morning, if I remember correctly, it is other resources. If someone gives money through our system or donates money through our system to um, activities like Carmel Innovations, again, I cannot book it usually as philanthropic dollars. It's an investment. So we have to book it differently, but again, I want to acknowledge the donor for doing this. This is why we're having the, those three uh, different kind of flavors with full transparency. What I think, and we've just seen in the last uh, couple of weeks, <coughs> is that the cooperation between Carmel and my department is going very, very, uh, very good. We see, we see increase in interest of people using our infrastructure, global infrastructure of the societies, of the friends of, to expose Carmel to potential donors. 
Uh, if I remember correctly, last year we had events in the UK, in the US, and in Switzerland last September when Manfred was just left. Uh, I asked Manfred to represent us in, uh, in, in Zurich. I was unable to travel. And this is the way that we are opening up the university to other potential givers. And I'm, I'm, this is why I call it givers, not necessarily a donation. But this is resource for money, and money is money. Right. Are there questions for Yariv? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. The president will show you all the secrets tomorrow. And the, the question is, what's the plan? How to make it? How? it, it you have to come it. back tomorrow to find out. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a teaser today, you know. Other questions for Yariv or for anyone else here? Would anyone on this panel want to make any final comment? Okay, uh, we have one last piece of business, that is to have a resolution to appoint an auditor for the university. Uh, do I have a uh, motion? Thank you, Sonia. Do I have a second? Thank you, Sharon. All those in favor, say uh, raise your hand. All those opposed, abstentions, uh, the resolution is adopted uh, unanimously. Uh, the last piece of business is to adjourn this plenary session. Do I have a motion? Gore, thank you very much. Do I have a second? Muli, thank you. All those in favor of adjourning this session, say aye. I didn't hear anyone. Aye. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>